Hello. Thank you. Okay. This is great. Um, okay. So the title of my talk is Heart Platform Lessons Learned. It's a very boring talk title. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm going to just talk about a lot of things. It's not going to be so much about technology, but approach to, to solving problems. And uh, what Harp is is a distributed platform um, built on Dropbox. And uh, I'm just going to talk about like my experience building that. So I go by Syntaxi Online. My name is Brock. Um, it's GitHub and Twitter. I'm known as Syntaxi. I'm from Canada. I made a big trek here. And it's my first time in South America, and it's absolutely incredible. Thank you guys for welcoming me. It's, it's been great being in this city. So I'm uh, probably first known for, for being a creator of the PhoneGap project. I haven't been involved in that project for a while now. Um, it's in better hands. Um, but, uh, but my new project is Harp. And uh, there, there is a, a commonality between these two projects, and that is um, that it, it revolves around the concept of distributing static assets. Um, who here has heard of PhoneGap? OK, most people in the room, that's great. How about Harp? Has anyone heard of it? OK, great. This is excellent. OK, so, um, so I'm really passionate about the promise of the web. I believe in the promise of the web. And, and, and what that is to me is that is like low risk, getting applications online easily, um, wide distribution, um, being able to get on every device, really easy, low risk setup, right? That was, that was what the web promised us. Uh, I'm not sure if it's delivered yet, and this is, this is the problem that, that Harp is, is solving. All right, so Harp is a static web server. It interprets, it does pre-processing on the fly, so Jade, Less, Stylus, you just name the file with the extension that you want and it will serve it up. There's a bit of a lag on my, uh, my next button, we'll see how this goes. All right, I'm just gonna exit out and Redo this. Sorry. Okay, there we go. So it looks like that. You put your files in there, you get a website. And the platform gets it online really easy. I'd love to make this into a pitch for Harp, but you can check it out yourself when you get the chance. What I think is going to be more valuable to you is what I learned along the way. Um, and it was a really fun endeavor. So it's a service oriented architecture. Um, that, that uses zero MQ to communicate all these nodes. And uh, it was designed so that each uh, part of the system can, can scale uh, independently from, from the other pieces. Um, to me, the scalable system is, is not, it's about modularity. And, and the reason for that is not so that you can like make things fast, it means that like when a piece of your system, whatever the bottleneck is, is, is wasn't implemented as good as it could be, you, you just throw it away and you rewrite it um, because every piece is small and, and easy to maintain. So it really comes down to fighting complexity. And I like the term, I prefer the term fighting complexity over abstracting complexity or t like I also taming complexity is a good way to go. But it, it, to me, there's a difference because you can abstract complexity, but you, you still have complexity in your, in your stack. So it's about at every layer making the right abstraction. Brian Kernigan, Canadian by the way, uh, said controlling complexity is the essence of computer programming. And I believe he's absolutely right. It's not about getting something that works, it's about getting it in a state that it can be maintained, it can be um, replaced, it can be um, adjusted, and you can replace a part without breaking the whole. And there's essentially, so, so to me, the, the next question would be like, okay, everyone here probably agrees with that, but like how do we define complexity? 
And, and I think, like, I've heard it described that there's three different ways to define complexity. The first way would be the, the user interface. What it's like for the user to use the tool that you just created. Um, how much effort it takes for them to understand the API that you've exposed. The next would be how it's implemented and when a new developer comes and adopts the code, how much complexity it is and difficult it is for them to understand the code and be able to make meaningful changes and contributions back to it. The problem with these two methods is they're, is they're subjective and they're often conflicting with each other. As you make something that's more user friendly, the complexity the in, of the internals goes up. And so these two things are always battling each other. The third way to define complexity is actually extremely simple and it's very objective. And it's somewhat counterintuitive, in fact. And we got a problem again. I guess I must need network for this. The promise of the web, right? Uh, it's just not connecting. All right, let's, let's just go like this. All right, you guys cool with this? All right, so it's counterintuitive, but number of lines of code is actually a really great way to measure complexity. Um, don't let your managers interpret that as productivity because lines of code is a horrible way to measure productivity, as we all know. So what is the, the ideal amount of, of code? Well, uh, Eric S. Raymond said, you know, 200 to 400 logical lines of C is, is optimal. So, you know, there is no hard rules on this, but I think, like, use this as a guideline because I believe that, that you can make meaningful um, libraries in, in 2 to 400 lines of code. And, and especially in Ruby or JavaScript, which you can do a lot more in 200 to 400 lines of code than you can in C. So you're probably asking me, like, okay, Brock, like, so what you're saying is as long as I break it up into, like, thousands of tiny modules that are a couple hundred lines of code each, I can build this crazy system with millions of lines of code and and like that does all this crazy stuff and basically yes, that, that is what I'm saying. So having built this platform, we're, we're a pretty small team, we're, we're four people. So we don't, we can't approach a problem like this the same way that, that other shops can. So we've got some things working in our favor, communication is easier in a team, team of four than it is on like a large team. But we can't do certain things like, like benchmark everything and, and all these. Like, I would love to do that. It would be fun. But it's completely impractical for a team of our size. So I kind of cheat the system. And I'm going to like let you guys in on, on one of my secrets. Um, it, it, I, I can kind of constructed this mental model that I put in my head whenever I'm building anything, essentially. And I think that, that th this mental model is not designed to be accurate. What it's designed to do is put me in a state of mind that helps me write fast systems. So I'm going to let you in on the secret. So it looks like this. I see latency in four stages. The process, the RAM, what's on disk, and the network. I visualize the process like this. It's like writing something on your hand. So if I'm going to define a variable, it's extremely quick to reference it. Um, I can reference that very quickly. It's very difficult for somebody else to reference something that's on my hand, right? So it, it has its limited uses, but it's extremely fast and tiny. As you can see, there's not that much you can put there. So the next is RAM. And relative to writing on your hand, I visualize RAM as having a little notebook something like this, right? And you can just like put database queries and things like that in there. So you have it for quick reference. Anyone want to guess what 
disk is? Relative to a notebook, I see disk as going to the local library. So that means like getting a cab or going into the, going into the subway or metro and going to your library and do a decimal system and you pick out the books that you need and you maybe put that in your knapsack or you write some books. You can only carry so many books, right? So there's a lot more information at your library and you can't possibly haul all of those books around. So I visualize the disk very similar to that. So that would be like the file system or accessing the database. Network, anyone want to guess? All right, you guys are quiet crowd. All right, relative to the other paradigms, uh, accessing the network, I visualize it as going to the airport, getting in a plane, going through customs, flying to Rio de Janeiro, and accessing their library, okay? Now this isn't necessarily always true, but remember, the point here is to guide you to make good decisions. So the assumption, when I'm going over the network, the assumption is always that this could be incredibly slow because machines can be very far apart from each other. So, it breaks down like this. Process is fast, on the right the network is slow, but it's volatile and durable on the right. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Caching is essentially the hack to get around this. These are like, the laws of physics are at play, but cache is how we get around this. It's like cheating the cap theorem, right? And of course you're just like, getting around it, but for the user's perception, you, you've made, you're capable of making the whole system fast. So if you're ever building a distributed system, you gotta remember this. You can't ever trust the network. You are going to have nodes go down, the networks are gonna go lost, I mean, we can see it right here with my slides, right? You can't trust the network, so you have to make things fault tolerant in a distributed system. All right, uh, this, is, this is a big one, and this to me is, I was at uh, Merv Camp in 2008, and there was a talk by Colin Miller that he spoke about not using HTTP, using TCP and other things, right? And it, at that time, like I saw everything as like a REST API and like HTTP and like I was doing a lot of Rails dev and things like that. And this really, it really opened up my, my eyes at that time and um, I now understand it a lot better, but I'm just gonna kind of um, share with you like my, my thoughts on this and uh, I'm gonna actually pop this up now. Hopefully this works. All right, so I'm gonna go over messaging patterns 101. All right, so we have these two processes. You can think of these as processes or you can think of them as different machines. That's not really super important. <coughs> All right, so a message comes from one process to the other and it waits to get a message back call this request reply. And this is a lot like HTTP, but except without the headers. Now let's say we have a process and we wanna distribute messages one at a time to worker processes. So a message comes in and it's going to pass it off. The next message comes in, it passes it to the next node. And the third message comes in and we round robin it all the way. We call this push-pull. And this can go both ways. It can fan out or fan in. PubSub is very similar, except when a message comes in, we broadcast it to all the nodes. So every message goes to every machine that's subscribed. Now lastly, this one's the simplest, is it's a pair. 
and all it does is pass one message to the other. But this one's actually extremely important. I'm going to show you why. So these are the basic building blocks. And let's say that we got our end user, we have our main application server, and we have a worker server. We naturally want to scale out these workers as they're doing long running heavy tasks. But eventually, you know, we don't want to put just one application server in production either, right? So the first problem we have is like, okay, well what if we have two servers and we can't know that it's going to always be two servers because <coughs> we need to scale that up as well. So it breaks down like this. These messages are coming in and it's fanning out with a push-pull. And when we want to bring up a new worker, we, bring, we boot it up and it connects to the dispatcher. And when the next message comes in, it goes to the new machine. Everything is great. Everything's fine so far. But what happens when we introduce a new dispatcher? Well, these processes have all bound to, to that one, the dispatcher. So they're unaware of where to get these new messages. So when a message from this dispatcher, it doesn't know where to put it, right? So this is a common discoverability problem. So one solution would be to restart the workers. So what you do is each worker now is aware of two dispatchers. So we restart this process. Okay, now it can get the message. Restart the next one. Okay, now it's online. It can receive from both. And finally, the last one. We restart it so it's aware of both dispatchers. And that message comes in. Okay, there's a new dispatcher. Okay, this is clearly not going to work out. This is a path to insanity to do it this way. So the solution is the pairing. So we pair these two processes together, and these are the, the processes that are bound to a port. And now the dispatchers, they know where to send a message when it wants work done. And workers, they know where to, to bind to or to, to connect to in order to get messages. This is essentially a broker. The great thing about this is that the, that the dispatchers are completely unaware of what's doing the work. And the workers are completely unaware of what, is, what the source of, of the message is. But that's great. We have a separation of concerns. This is very important. So this now lets us, now that we have this broker, we can scale up the, the servers and the workers independently. And this is great. OK, the life cycle of a job. So you essentially got these building blocks, right? And you can see that, like, I'm not showing you code here. But if what you're designing doesn't work on paper, it's not going to work on code either. So you can design these systems, and each system is going to be slightly different, depending on where you're comfortable with the bottleneck, where you're comfortable with, with, the, um, with the faults. And, and, and the whole point in, in engineering these systems is to push the complexity or push the, the uh, bottleneck to the place where you're most comfortable and the, the place where it works best for your system. So, you design these, these tasks, so in our case, we might do something like this. We're going to do a push-pull. These represent all the messages. Then when a worker gets a message, it's going to do a request reply to some sort of source <coughs> through the broker. And then it's going to emit these pub-sub events saying it's progress, like we're 10%, we're 11%, everything's good. And then finally, a request reply and a pub sub again to, to say we're all finished. And you might be thinking like, hey, 
Brock, this is crazy. Like you talked about reducing complexity, but like all these messages going around, it's getting kind of crazy, right? Well, it, it's not though. Like you, you, you construct the pattern that works for your system, and then you abstract it into a clean interface. So in this case, this is, this is our actual interface. And this is the, the, the single function that our workers expose. So we have, uh, we have a task that we send to a worker machine. This is from the, the perspective of a dispatcher. And then it gets these progress events, end events, error events. All of this is abstracted, right? So it doesn't even know that it's going over a message queue. It doesn't care. It doesn't need to care. All right. I'm running out of time, but I'm going to move a little bit faster. Um, but there's a few things I want to get off my chest. My suggestion is to avoid SQL. For what it's worth, uh, Ruby is way ahead with its SQL libraries. It, its libraries are very mature. The system that I'm describing to you is all written in Node, but uh, it, it's worth mentioning that we're actually using, we have one Ruby file, and that is schema.rb, and it's a data mapper file that, that just handles the migrations. And it's great, because there is no equivalent in Node that's nearly as mature and elegant. So it's really nice. Here's another cheat I do, and SQL advocates probably wouldn't recommend this, but this is essentially the same as a set in a key value store, and I don't know why it needs to be this obtuse, but uh, insert on duplicate key update basically says set this value in the database. All right, rest. Um, this has been controversial for some reason when I've, when I've mentioned this, but I would also avoid REST if you can, um, especially for internal systems. And the reason is this, is that REST is optimized for when you have a library and you want to expose it and you have no idea on the other side what is consuming that library. REST is for humans. And that's the problem, is that everybody sees it a little bit differently. You'd be thinking, like, there's probably half of you be like, yeah, that's a perfectly rational way to do a post REST API. And the other half of you is like, no, that's, that's ridiculous. I would do it like this. I want JSON being serialized. And then others are going, well, yeah, but, you know, the JSON should be in the header. And others are like, duh, just put it in the URL, right? So this has complexity that is completely unnecessary. It goes on. Status codes. REST is a productivity killer. So my suggestion is, is abstract the HTTP and offer both the server and the client side of things. Essentially, this is all we want. We want a function that takes an object and it's going to return some errors if it's not right. Otherwise, it's correct. I'm going to brush over this. So in summary, basically, my suggestion is to identify the problem, see the patterns and protocols, not the tools and the frameworks. Um, this is a post I encourage you all to read. This is from the author of Capistrano. And he's talking about just how Capistrano is being used, and he's having troubles maintaining it because he doesn't even necessarily think that Capistrano is, is relevant the same way that it has been in the past. And these are some of the things that he says. Uh, RubyGem is an awful platform um, that like, it's horrible to, to install and, and really give that post a, um, a, a read because it gives insight into how people associate the problems with these tools rather than uh, identifying the problem itself and then finding out the most elegant way to solve it. So don't see this see this. Identify the problem and build and find the tool. Punch girls, you're doing it right. <laughs> and learn your own lessons. Thank you.